All right, let's go. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our session today uh, on teachers of color, district pilots designed to increase recruitment and retention. My name is Kimberly Smith. I'm the Chief Inclusive Innovation Officer at Digital Promise. And I'm here uh, with a wonderful panel of um, school district leaders and teachers who are gonna share with you about uh, pilots that they are implementing to support the recruitment and retention of teachers of color. So we are gonna dive right into our topic uh, this morning. And so I'm gonna go ahead and advance our slides here. Uh, this work uh, that you're going to hear about uh, is an initiative that is two years in the making. Uh, this initiative is focused on supporting uh, five school districts from the League of Innovative Schools, and I'll share more about the League in a second, who have been spending the past um, 18 months focused on uh, designing uh, recruitment and retention solutions uh, in collaboration, in co-leadership, uh, in co-research and co-design with teachers of color. Uh, so it's a very unique pilot in that teachers of color are uh, co-leading this effort uh, with the districts that they're in. And uh, you'll see uh, the progress and some of the results of that work today. This work lives within Digital Promise. We are an 11-year-old nonprofit. Uh, we're funded, uh, well, I should say we are appropriated uh, in the Higher Education Act. Uh, in the George Bush administration and funded uh, through the Obama administration launched in 2011. Our focus is on supporting schools and districts across the country in advancing teaching and learning uh, through innovation and technology and equity. The Center for Inclusive Innovation lives within Digital Promise. It's a two-year-old center uh, that focuses on how communities uh, can work in partnership with school districts to transform education. And so uh, the work that we do is really around this idea of inclusive innovation, which by definition is how do you take away the barriers that have impeded uh, underrepresented individuals from being at the education innovation table? So how do you create a new table where individuals who have never been at the table before can lead, participate, participate in, and benefit from innovation. So in our model of inclusive innovation, uh, you have students, teachers, parents, community members uh, leading, right? They're, they're having positions of power and authority. They're participating as creators and designers, and they're benefiting ensuring that the outcomes meet the needs uh, uh, academically, of course, but also um, social, emotional, and other needs uh, that are relevant to communities. The work within the center is really focused on creating opportunities for students who are furthest from opportunity to learn, grow, and thrive as their authentic selves. Uh, we support um, all uh, definitions of students who are historically and systematically excluded uh, and as I mentioned, the outcomes are focused on creating the conditions that will enable uh, students to thrive. This is rooted in the League of Innovative Schools. This is a network of districts that have been engaged in uh, work to advance teaching and learning around innovation, technology, and equity since the launch of Digital Promise. Today, we have over 150 districts in 39 states reaching 4 million students. Uh, and the league is growing. In fact, just last week, we had our biannual convening hosted by Compton Unified and El Segundo Unified in Los Angeles and had about 300 uh, district leaders and teachers and principals um, exploring new models for teaching and learning. So this is what we do every day at Digital Promise and the center works in partnership with league districts to advance uh, their initiatives for students that are underserved. This work um, is funded by the Walton Family Foundation and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, uh, is really focused on how do we uh, support the capacity for school districts around teacher of color recruitment and retention. Uh, these are the districts that are engaged in this work, uh, Princeton City Schools, 
uh, Lexington 1, Huntley Community School District 158, Hampton Township, Avonworth School District, and Middletown City Schools. Uh, today, you will hear from Huntley School District 158 and Middletown City Schools about their efforts. Uh, and every one of these districts is focused on a different initiative, whether it's mentoring, uh, blackmail fellowship, building pipeline with historically back uh, colleges and universities. Uh, they each have chosen an initiative around their own problem of practice. Uh, so we don't, um, we don't focus on one initiative. We support the problem of practice that they want to address in this work. So I am so excited to have here today, uh, Dr. Rocio Del, Del Castillo, who's the Assistant Superintendent of Special Services at Huntley Community School District, Evelyn Gonzalez, who's a teacher at Huntley, and Dr. Scott Rowe, who's a superintendent at Huntley, Marlon Stiles, who's superintendent at Middletown City School District. Uh, and I wanna give them each a chance to say hello. Uh, so Marlon, why don't you start, just tell folks a little bit about Middletown City Schools. Yeah, great to be here. Excited to spend uh, some learning space with everyone here this morning. Marlon Stiles, proud superintendent here at Middletown City School District, home of the here in Southwest Ohio. Excited to hear from Scott and his team as well. Uh, definitely in for a treat. We are an urban district, 10 schools, 6,200 plus students, uh, free and reduced lunch rate of 100%, but a thriving school district right now. Unbelievable school culture. Uh, awfully proud of our students and staff. Excited to share a little bit of uh, knowledge about what we're doing around Teachers of Color today. Great. Thanks, Marlon. Scott, you want to share about Huntley? Uh, sure. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, as uh, Kim said, my name is Scott Rowe. I'm the superintendent in Huntley 158. Huntley is a uh, far northwestern suburban school uh, outside of Chicago. Um, we are we're at one point, we're the fastest growing community in the state of Illinois. And for a period of about 10 years, we're in the top 10 uh, and transformed from a, a rural farming community to that of a, of a suburban community. Um, and in the process have, have transitioned from 95 plus percent white to today at about 72% not, or 72% white. So our demographics are shifting dramatically, which is uh, the primary focus of our, uh, of our work to ensure that our students uh, see themselves and those that lead their classrooms and our schools and, uh, and feel supported and, and comfortable being who they are while they come and learn with us. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Rocio, you want to talk a little bit about your role at Huntley? Yes. Hello. Good morning. Rocio Castillo, Assistant Superintendent for Special Services. I, uh, I oversee, as Scott was saying, our demographics are changing really uh, very fast. And uh, I uh, have the pleasure to oversee the dual language, the dual language implementation when we started five years ago. And that's going to be part of uh, what we're going to talk a little about our problem of practice. And I also uh, facilitating the equity uh, initiatives here in the district, the equity job. I also are uh, our special services. So I think when this position was created, it was a position to give some support and leadership for all our students that were uh, historically underrepresented. So uh, this is my position here in Huntsville School District. Great, thank you. And Evelyn, you're a teacher. You wanna talk about what you teach and how long you've been at Huntley? Yes, hi, I'm Evelyn Gonzalez. I am the fourth grade dual teacher here at Huntley. Um, I'm at Lickey Elementary School. I teach 50-50 models, so 50% of my instruction is done in Spanish, and 50% of my other instruction is done in English. Great. Welcome. Glad to have you all here. So we're going to start by learning a little bit about the, each district's work and the pilot that they developed. Uh, we have a, just a brief overview here. We're going to start with uh, Marlon to talk a little bit about recruitment through his strategy, and then we'll go to Scott to talk about the retention piece. Can I believe that's the sign for me to talk about recruitment? Yes. All right. Uh, excited to be here, everyone, again. I uh, want to share a little bit today about the Admiral Squad here at Middletown City School District. Uh, we have taken this on as a commitment to the profession to recruit more Black male educators into the profession. Uh, we have partnered with a BIPOC, a BIPOC organization called He Is Me. Uh, a gentleman named Robert Hendricks has been our point of contact. Unbelievable partnership. 
to help us imagine how to get more black males into the profession. Our recruitment efforts really have centered around uh, the idea that we want to add 25 additional black male certified educators into our school system over the next five hiring seasons, right? We're not trying to diversify our staff. We are making a commitment to hire 25 black male certified educators. Through our partnership with He Is Me, we have a great program uh, in our secondary buildings called He Is Me. Uh, we have undecided black males who are freshmen at local higher education institutions that we have recruited into mentoring roles here inside of our district to mentor our black males in our secondary buildings. The idea here is that they fall in love with working with youth uh, through the partnership with He Is Me. Uh, we capture that uh, new, newly discovered passion we really work with uh, the, the freshman black male students uh, to consider entering into the profession. Obviously, the gentlemen you see here on the picture are black males that are currently employed in our school district called admirals. We'll get into admiral squad here shortly. But the idea is our admirals really start to influence uh, our youth and our school buildings, as well as the mentors coming from our hired institutions. And we work to push them into teacher preparation programs at higher education institutions. We have a great partnership with Miami University uh, to where we're working on what does preparation look like as far as certification for black males uh, with the ultimate idea that they graduate with a teaching license. Uh, from our perspective, as you see here, the Admiral Squad is designed as not just necessarily um, a recruitment tool. We also use it as a black male fellowship uh, to create what we're calling our own brotherhood, uh, a safe space for black males in the district. Uh, to have their own authentic space, uh, to be their own authentic selves, uh, to collaborate and work with one another to inspire us uh, to not only just get into the profession, but to stay in it as well. Uh, so really thrilled about what we have here. The, the secret sauce for us has been partnerships with BIPOC organizations, partnerships at higher education institutions, but more importantly, convening current Black males in our school system to go out into Black student unions at the higher ed institutions engage their student bodies and find those undecided black males and let them know for hopefully the first time in their life probably uh, that they are needed they're valued um, and we're seeking them in the profession to make a difference um, i think our next slide will kind of give you um, a qr code um, i think you have that slide i believe uh, we've got a great brand here um, inside of our district our admiral squad is active if you want to take a look at our infomercial here you'll see current admirals out and about in the buildings uh, really trying to spread some joy but the whole concept here um, is that we really want to bring more black males into the profession as certified educators very easy for school districts across the country to bring in black males as coaches as paraprofessionals as aides as disciplinarians but really pushing the certification piece uh, for the sake of our children so we are up and running now for about what probably three months i would say uh, so a brand new group, but we are active out and about right now, uh, really pushing the envelope here in our region. Um, excited to be working with some higher ed institutions on webinars. Uh, we've got a session coming up this Friday with Miami University about the teacher shortage. Uh, we're going to talk about the teacher shortage of black males in the profession. Uh, so our admirals are going to be in a panel talking about how regionally we can really start to influence uh the workforce needs that we have uh coming from our kids for black males in the classroom so excited to be here with you today we're looking forward to some q a with you later on as well as hearing from scott and his team about the great work that they're doing that's great marlon i'm gonna ask you one question and uh then we'll segue to huntley uh one of the things that you talk a lot about with admiral squad is this underlying notion of a brotherhood and and why that's important as a as a black male. You, know, you were a black male ed educator uh, a few moons ago. Can you just talk about this idea of a brotherhood and why that matters? Absolutely willing to do it. But I just want to say yes. I am old. I got gray hair. So when you say many moons ago, Kim, you definitely are right. I had to shave some of those out this morning for the sake of the presentation. Uh, but the brotherhood is is uh, very much needed. You'll hear oftentimes black males in our district say, "Well, I'm the only black male in the entire building." Um, there's no one that looks like me, talks like me, dresses like me, or even has hair like me. Uh, so it's nice to have an environment where I can be my authentic self, uh, but actually get associated with other black males and the experiences that they are having. Um, so, for example, we have uh, a young man who is pursuing his teaching license, but black males have wrapped their arms around him to help him navigate the cultural barrier to get his license. You might see a black male who's currently being looked at as a disciplinary in the building. Hey, can you talk to so-and-so? 
Um, we might have black males that aren't getting invited to building committees or district committees, uh, but it's nice to have a fellowship uh, where we can be our authentic selves, but also push one another uh, to really mold this new standard of what black males offer in the profession and how impactful and inspiring we can be for our youth. It's just a nice safe space uh, where we can be us. Uh, we walk around, we wear purple hoodies, we don't wear shirt and ties. I'll take this thing off when we get done. Um, but it's who we are, what we stand for, and more importantly, uh, we're not the dominant race or gender in the profession. It's nice to have a space uh, where you have black males just like you who are in the profession for the same passionate reasons. Great. Thanks, Marlon. All righties. Uh, so uh, we'll talk much more about Admiral Squad and what's happening in Middletown on the recruitment side. Just want to give you a flavor of each district's initiative. We're going to talk, turn to Scott and talk a little bit about the retention piece. So maybe give some background and context for Huntley's project. Absolutely. And, you know, thanks, Marlon. Wonderful work you guys are doing, Milton. I always enjoy getting getting your updates. Um, but something that, as Marlon was, was speaking, sparked a memory for me as to why um, this is so important to us. When I, I, prior to this role, this is my fifth year as superintendent at Huntley 158. And prior to this, I spent five years serving as the principal of our high school. 3,000 students. So we have just under 9,000 students district wide, uh, nine large buildings um, in our district uh, serving pre K through 22. And, and when I took this role, I hired a, a dynamic black leader who is now serving our high school students as principal. And as I was touring him, um, the first time he visited and, and actually had to tour the halls, Students approached him to find out who he was and learn about him that I had strong relationships with as a principal, but immediately in those interactions, I, I could never be for them what they needed him to be. And that was an eye-opening experience for me, a humbling experience for me, because in our school district, relationships drive all of our work. And we, we place a lot of value and emphasis on our, on our relationships and caring for one another and working together. Our teachers have a, a significant voice and that's by design. Um, but to see that was, uh, was humbling and, and, it, and it's really driven some of the work. So as we got into this, this, this cohort that Kim mentioned started off as, a, as an, an equity journey of just superintendent leaders learning together and, and, and beginning this journey. Um, and I've learned a ton from, from my colleagues, but so initially we jumped into this with the expectation that recruitment was going to be our area of emphasis as, uh, as we had, you know, we had, I think two black teachers and maybe, um, you know, 10 or 12 Hispanic teachers um, who were serving our dual language program. And out of 700 certified staff members, you know, those percentages are quite low. So we wanted to recruit. And the picture that you're looking at is actually of our first design studio where we had um, a number of teachers, you know, including Evelyn and, and Rocio, who, who helped lead this, but with, with university partners and community partners, and began to evaluate this recruitment path of how can we, in suburban Chicago, where there is no, there are no HBCUs close by, the tapping into Northern Illinois University the first question, okay, let, we have a professional development school with them where we house, uh, we host 50 plus student teachers a year, um, very few of which are teachers of color. And how can we in increase that, that percentage? And they kind of chuckled and said, get in line. Everybody's trying to do that. So, um, and then we got into the design studio and heard from Evelyn and some of the other teachers on our, uh, on our team that day. And what they shared with us, a light bulb went off of, we need to focus on retention before we need to focus on recruitment. Um, and what will come out as we talk a little bit more about it is, as we've built our dual language program, and as Rocio mentioned, it's only five years old. So it's, it's kindergarten through fourth grade uh, currently. Um, but, our, but we've had to, you know, when you start a new program of this kind of magnitude in, across five elementaries, um, it's, it's controlled pretty heavily at the, at the district level in terms of ensuring fidelity across all of the buildings um, and what, what our teachers shared with us was we feel a connection to the dual language program, but we're struggling with our connection to the building and be feeling as if we're members of the team. And that, you know, again, humbling experience for us when our, when our, our teachers shared what their experiences have been for us. So at that point, we shifted our focus to, um, to recruit or retention. 
and our host at our second design studio and, and kind of analyze who, you know, where are we, what are we trying to build and what do our, our teachers need to really improve this area of feeling of belonging into the school district. Uh, and collectively, we decided on uh, the establishment of, of affinity groups. And, and we, have, we have kicked off with two initial affinity groups, one uh, for teachers of color, and then one for our educators or employer, employees of um, LGBTQ+. Um, uh, so that, and, and the design being that, that they have a safe space, they can come collaborate with one another about their experiences in our school district, creating a sense of community but there's a, a direct line of communication to the cabinet level um, district administration so we can keep our lines of communication open, strengthen our relationship and understand what we need to do to best serve our employees so that they wanna stay. Um, and with that, the idea is, is that we build and the flywheel starts to spin uh, and through word of mouth, the culture inside our district is one that is welcoming and very attractive to others that, uh, that wanna come join our team. Uh, Rocio and Evelyn, if you have anything to add, I would welcome your thoughts, if that's okay, Kim. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yes, I think that's exactly what Scott says. We we were uh, starting that with the idea of uh, of recruiting, right? But then retention goes so much uh, deep than what we thought. And ha having the teachers' boys in what we are doing was very important, right? Having coming from them as like we want to stay here, we love the district, but this is how I'm feeling, I think was very important for us. Uh, we have had very good, uh, we've been really su succeeding in recruiting uh, teachers for our dual language program. We are lucky on that. We put a lot of effort in recruiting our teachers, but how do they feel that sense of belonging? Even, even for me, I'm uh, five years ago, Huntley was a very different demographics and I was finding my way to see why Huntley, right? How, what's my my way to create or impact or have an impact in, in a district that uh, doesn't look like me. And uh, I think I, I found why, my why here. And while our demographics are changing, we're trying really hard to make our teachers, not only our dual language teacher, but our, we, we have a high, being successful high teachers outside the dual language program that are also Latino. So how we make them, uh, you know, we create that sense of belonging and they are part of our district. I think that's that's that came really loud and clear for the teachers. And I'm uh, very proud that we are following the teacher's direction and hearing to the teacher voices. Evelyn, would you like to add your perspective? Because it's this is I love this example, right? Where the voice of teachers of color uh, helped to shift the direction a bit. Uh, so, do you want to add any um, thoughts to what they're sharing? Yes. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I have a bit of a sore throat. Um, so, just like Rocio said, we did feel a bit um, of inclusion. Um, we needed more of that. After that first meeting that we had with the university administrators, I can say from us teachers that were there um, that we now feel more like we belong because now we know that we are heard and we're going to be valued for the work that we make. And um, so it's given us a voice with the creation now that we also have affinity groups. And we're, we're also planning uh, multicultural affairs. And not only that, like with this, after that meeting, I felt like I could even go out to the monolingual teachers and say, hey, this is what we do. This is our work, right? So now I'm not, I'm not afraid to say this is what we do. And it might look a little different than monolingual teachers, but hey, that's okay, right? Because dual, just, it's not gonna work just like the monolingual, but still the monolingual teachers do share a lot of stuff with us that they do. And we share a lot of stuff that we do now with it too. Great, great, thank you. I, I love to hear your voice and how the ripple effect of this has uh, influenced um, not only your relationships internally, your relationships in the building and relationships with other teachers. That's, that's, that's uh, incredible to hear, so thank you for that. Uh, one of the things that's been really interesting about this part two of this work, and I should share with everyone in the audience that, that year one, 
was a, a set of design studios that were done only with teachers of color. So there were no district leaders, principals uh, in the room. And so with each district, we sat with their teachers of color through a series of design studios. And it was over 125 teachers across the country. They developed 22 concepts, rec recruitment and retention concepts. And from that first year of work, this second year of work took shape. The difference with year two is that we now have a diverse stakeholder group coming into this work because when you start to stand up a pilot, there are post-secondary institutions, there are partners and collaborators, both internally and externally to the district that have to be considered. Both of these districts um, brought together folks um, from the district, from higher education, from um, external partnerships to bring these pilots to life. So um, Marlon, we'll go back to you. And can you talk a little bit about the stakeholders that you had at your table for this work? Yeah, absolutely. I think for us here in Middletown City School District, uh, this is probably one of the most dynamic or, uh, parts of the process uh, that really landed us in a very dynamic place with the Admiral Squad. I want to highlight for the sake of time just the number one that you see there around Middletown City Schools. Uh, yes, we had higher ed and the partners engaged, but for us, we picked um, a teacher of color. His name was Terrence Plummer. Um, it was unique having Terrence as the sole teacher of color uh, because part of the Center for Inclusive Innovations process is to try to personify your problem of practice. We were able to bring Terrence in and he was able to take an entire design studio and just tell his experience from high school to present day as a third year elementary uh, educator. We got to get very close to his journey, understand unique perspective and experiences, even though as a black male, I shared some of those. Uh, we we're able to gain some insights about his what I call go through uh, and get a true sense of what his go through has been and what his go through continues to be as a certified black male educator. It allowed us to better understand our problem of practice. Uh, more importantly, it was able to, to give us a sense of direction about how we needed to design certain portions of this system uh, that we were creating for uh, this, this Admiral Squad Affinity Group that we created. Without Terrence's uh, um, participation, um, and really he stole the show as a key leader, without that number one on that screen there under teacher of color, I don't believe we'd have been able to come up with such a powerful opportunity for our kids here in the district. Thank you for that. I uh, And I should emphasize with folks that uh, we share the, the numbers here just so you get a sense of this, the kind of flavor of the folks that were at the table in this second phase of work. Um, but the voice and how we prioritize voice and the voice of teacher of color is the same, right? So it's, it's first and foremost, and uh, teachers of color voices are prioritized in this framework. Uh, what Marla's talking about really quickly is when you look at a side-by-side -side journey map, right, of a teacher of color and their experience both being recruited and retained in a school district, and you line that up with kind of the, the uh, perspectives on what their experience has been from others, it's an interesting kind of analysis, right, to see what the experience has been and what the perspective uh, is of the experience and it provides a lot of opportunity for co-creation and co-design when that space is opened up by looking at these journey maps. So thanks for underscoring that, Marlon. Let's go to um, Scott and Rocio and Evelyn to talk a little bit about your stakeholder group. Sure. Um, well, our stakeholder group, as you see, that from the teachers of color, we and we had representatives from our dual language program as, as well as a general education setting. Um, and then the higher ed, you know, Northern Illinois University and Illinois State University were both represented. Uh, with us. And then um, Rocio was able to coordinate some of our just community partners um, that um, that support programming in the community, connecting uh, connecting families with uh, with resources or um, or programs that might 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 suit their needs. Rocio, is there any specific information to add to that? I'd welcome that. Yes, we uh, we contact LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens. So uh, they came and uh, because we know that we have a big group of teachers uh, that were uh, Latinx and uh, also our uh, 
local college mcc was here so with uh, all those partners we have like kind of a, a view in how we can collaborate with, with the communities to support our our teachers uh yep i think uh we still are you know, partnership with Lulac. So that was that was a big partner for, for that at the at the first session. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, and so uh, partnerships are critical for districts to support this work. Um, and, you know, I think, and Marlon, you mentioned he is me as a partner that has been supporting the work. So it's really critical to think about both internal supports and, and grow your own and what the complement can be from external organizations that can support your work. So a question for you all in terms of what has been the most challenging aspect of this work and what has been the most rewarding, I'm gonna give Scott and team the, the mic the first on, on this one. Well, I, I think the most challenging, um, it goes hand in hand with the, with the prior question in terms of the systemic model is, um, I mentioned earlier, we, we think of ourselves as, as being very relational focused and relationships um, and problem solving really starts with, you know, we have we, we, we push the mindset of get the right people around the table and, and all those that are involved and let's solve the problem. Well, what's challenging about that is, is, is just talking about it and putting forth effort at every building to make this better, I believe was, was there and, and everyone's heart was in the right place. But we needed to think about this systemically of how do we create opportunities and structures so that our, our staff can uh, can come together with a purpose. Um, because our best effort of just being good people wanting to do right by, by our students and, and have everyone that works with us um, feeling as if they're valued is great. But if we if it's not very organized with with identified leadership roles and everyone understands from you know because these these affinity groups consist of a facilitator um a member and then allies well um sometimes we have to tell and ensure that the allies know what what their place is in this group in in terms of support versus being take overtaking because of their passion for wanting uh wanting to help so um the most rewarding we had our kickoff um, last week and, and we got together and, and, and shared, you know, kind of had shared some appetizers and, um, and drinks at a local restaurant and, and just talked about our purpose, shared the story and the journey of, of where we've come as a school district over the really last maybe 10 years leading up to this. And, um, and then started some, some tabletop conversations around the need and gave our teachers the opportunity to kind of really engage and see what this could be in terms of building relationships with folks across across the district that they don't have the opportunity to collaborate with very regularly, uh, and then we left very energized and uh, at least at least I did. Hopefully Evelyn uh, can share the same experience because I know she was there. But um, it, it's been a very rewarding experience thus far, and I only hope that that builds. I think what's exciting for me is is that this it shifts the ownership onto our our teachers and and staff members that are going to be actively participating. And it becomes their group that they can then they have avenues of of informing us what uh, what they're what they're talking about that we need to know. But it really is their group and that ownership lives with them. That's what I'm most excited about. Um, Evelyn, if you want to share some of your thoughts about the uh, the kickoff, I'd, I'd love it. Hi, yes. <clears throat> so we did have that um, meeting and at that meeting, I felt heard. Right. Because at the beginning of all of this, the most challenging for me as a teacher was speaking up, right? Because you always fear like, is something really going to be done or am I just going to get judged for feeling this way? But after these meetings, now all those feelings have, they're, they're changed, right? They're gone. Um, now I feel heard. And that's how, like, that's how I know things are changing. Things will get done for us. Um, now the most rewarding for sure uh, would be to have a voice, Right to not be afraid of speaking up and saying like, "Hey, this is what's happening. What can we do about it?" I I tell I even tell my dual teams um, all the time like, "Hey, let me know if anything's going on. Like, if if you have a problem, speak up. Like, we have people that will listen to us." Um, and I love the feeling of being heard and knowing that something will be done for us. That's powerful. Go ahead, Rosie. Yeah, I'll have to share the most challenging piece was to hear stories. 
to hear the stories of the teachers, right? The, you know, the feel of isolation and sometimes not sense of belonging. I'm not part of this, not good enough. And I have felt that in my life too. So just hearing that, it was like going over again in my own in my own process and my own journey, uh, it was tough. It was it was just difficult, you know. Uh, I, I know it was difficult for all of us as an administrative team because that's exactly what we didn't want. We didn't know how deep it was, and that's what hearing Evelyn say that she's being heard. It's so rewarding, and the rewarding part also was hearing the story, you know create an environment when the teachers can't speak up because sometimes it's difficult from you know in our positions to speak and say this is what I need and hearing from them this is how I feel but I know that there's a trust between us and this is how I want to feel right I think that moment for us was uh pivotal in all the whole process that that first meeting and then again, that's the most rewarding, the stories and how we incorporate their voices in moving forward towards creating this uh, environment that we want for our students. Our motto is all teachers, uh, all students always, and it could be all teachers always all the time. So I think that was a challenging part to hear their stories because sometimes, you know, if you don't speak up, people don't know exactly what how you feel. And so hearing that uh, today from Evelyn, it, it really makes everything uh, so much, you know, rewarding now the whole process. So that's both the challenging part and the rewarding part. Yes, I'm, I'm so glad you're um, talking about this foundation of trust, right, that has to be built. Uh, one of the key principles of inclusive innovation is this idea of connect and commit, right? It's building trust, it's building the foundation, it's building the shared commitment. And relationships, especially when it comes to equity, relationships matter um, so, so much. Uh, every initiative that has launched from this project is rooted in community and building community and building relationship. And so the vulnerability that Evelyn talks about can come forward because there is a feeling of trust. Uh, and, uh, and so thank you for just sharing that, that that foundational piece has to be built for this to, to be able to move forward in a meaningful way. Uh, I'm gonna invite folks that are out there in the world to uh, post to chat any questions you might have. Uh, in fact, there's one that's come up right now. So uh, I'm gonna uh, read this off so we can, we can hear it. And then uh, we do have other questions, but I'm gonna prioritize the, the audience questions. Can you speak to the challenges of creating a pipeline of teachers of color? It takes money. To get the credentials, for example, starts with a BA degree, teacher preparation, et cetera. Uh, so how are we navigating some of those potential barriers around teachers of color? Marlon, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, great question. It was actually going to be one of my reflections around one of the most challenging aspects of the work. Um, and it wasn't the money. For us, it was the partnership with higher education institutions because um, the current system is it's not generating black male interest for us, and it's not generating black male success around earning the certifications. Um, so our lean in with our BIPOC organization on the higher ed institutions was simply can we rethink, I won't even say reimagine, but just reshift, reshift the current preparation program practices uh, to really consider new ways to generate interest in the profession but then also success rates and uh, our black males earning the, the certificates at the end of the programs. So we have entertained the idea of a fellowship with He Is Me. Again, this is very low cost. Uh, they already have a program set up. Um, I think we're generating about maybe $10,000 total for all, all partnership with He Is Me, maybe a little bit more. Uh, so money has not been the factor, but for us, our request for our higher education institution was, uh, can we consider some type of experience base, some type of service based model for preparation for these black males who are entering the preparation programs out of pure passion, um, not necessarily need or recruitment, but pure passion. Uh, so as I'm doing a fellowship with a group of youth at a middle school, uh, can that experience generate some type of credit towards my preparation program as far as credits and experience? My suggestion for anyone exploring this idea of a pipeline 
um, this is me, one person, I would shy away from the grow your own stale, uh, very slow motion moving pipeline programs uh, that historically we have tried to use in the uh, profession in the past. They have not generated any systemic outputs uh, to really change the metrics of teachers of color um, in the profession. So I think it's a, a good time for us to take the challenge to really push our thinking systemically uh, to reshift some practices that might generate more interest from black males, but also get them to the finish line with the credentials like you were asking before. That's great. Before I um, pass the question to the Huntley team, Marlon, do you want to speak about what's been the most rewarding for you? Yeah, I'll go super fast here. For us here in Middletown City School District, the Admiral Squad, uh, you can see the QR code behind me, but as you think about the Admiral Squad, it hasn't been about the black male superintendent being proud of the Admiral Squad, though I, I actually am. For us, we're starting to see our black males, just like you heard from Ms. Gonzalez, right? I feel included. I found my voice. I've been activated, rejuvenated, and I'm now engaged and I'm ready to impact. Um, our admirals have been in four different school buildings. I'll take Highview Sixth Grade Center, for example. Uh, principals have provided uh, sub coverage. We've had 30 admirals visiting one school. We visited every single classroom. We impacted and touched every single kid in that building. A uh, quick story for you real fast, I'll give it to you 30 seconds. We had two black males, sixth graders who said they wanted to be a PE teacher when they grew up. Quickly called over one of our admirals, Mr. George Kennerly, black male PE teacher in an elementary building. He spent five minutes with those kids. We all backed away. When he walked away from those two young men, they looked at each other and one of them said, that's going to be us when we grow up, right? Representation matters. Our admirals are making an impact. And that's been the most rewarding part. That's great. Thank you. Um, Scott, the question was around some of the barriers, particularly around credentials, right? The cost. I know that you have been talking to local universities. I know, and you're not focused, you know, solely on recruitment right now, but any thoughts around some of those? We barriers? see, I mean, we see the the challenges of cost, even from helping our teachers, you know, move over to the right as quickly as 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 they would like to. Pursuing post secondary degree is 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 something. Uh, even the post they're beyond the bachelor the, to the master's degree. A lot of teachers are the loan and and is is not is not conducive to, to that happening. So um, I mentioned before our, our professional development school, with that comes a lot of kickback from the university in terms of tuition waivers. So people that are internal, whether it be paraprofessionals that decide they wanna pursue a teaching certification or our educators, we can use that to offset some of that car cost and support of that. Um, you know, I, I think Marlon's right about those teacher pipelines in terms of how long they take and they're not really reproducing. Uh, or producing the reward, um, yet there's still some value of like encouraging as, as he is, encouraging kids to go into education. And if we look at that, the opportunities of just getting creative with scholarships and partnerships in the community um, can be really rewarding. An idea that I'm, you know, I'm pushing with our education foundation is um, if we can get a Huntley grad that pursues education, um, is there some form of a tuition reimbursement um, or reward that if they have a certain number of successful years in, in our school district post graduation, that we might have a five thousand dollar you know donation toward their their student loans. You have to get creative in, in terms of the the things that you can control, so that we can offset some of that. And um, and there's no perfect solution though. It's a, it's a challenge. I don't think anyone has an answer to. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, and one that. Uh, we have to double down on. I love the idea of what you're talking about, tuition reimbursement. I love the idea of service, right? Treating this as service and allowing folks to uh, have that service go towards their uh, financial. Uh, you know, Kim, I actually, I'll, I'll make, yeah. make one more point. Community yeah. colleges are becoming much more open minded to breaking down some of the barriers of um, of the the associate's degree and obtaining mm -hmm. that after graduation you know we, we're in our first year of a dual degree program with our uh, McHenry County College uh, where you can uh, graduate essentially after the summer of your high school graduation with your associate's degree too and for a third of the cost sitting with the students so you can enter you know 18 and have two years of college left so that offsets some of that cost university shares a portion and we share a portion to help bridge that gap so I think it's about creativity and just talking with those in the community of what can we do together mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for that. Um, so there are some folks out here that are certainly seeking some advice uh, as they are looking to diversify their workforce. Uh, 
And so school districts, um, school leaders that are seeking uh, your thoughts, uh, what is some advice that you would give to them? Uh, and I'd go to Rocio first on this one. I just want to add uh, mentorship. It's very important. The, now that we are, when we're interviewing uh, teachers of colors, they ask definitely for, uh, do you have any mentorship? Do you have any kind of uh, supports that will help me navigate the system? Some of our teachers are immigrants. Some of our teachers are first generation. So I have been asking many interviews, do you have any supports that will help us navigate the system, right? Uh, they don't only ask about uh, like 10 years ago about you know salary or they asked about the program the supports that we have for students of color how uh, our supports for our bilingual students or uh, our equity work we have attracted a lot of young new teachers out of school because of the equity work that we're doing so i think the stronger of are your system of support, the more teachers of colors you're going to attract. So how is the district you make this effort to be ready to attract teacher of colors? It's definitely the, the work that you're doing for your students of color. So I think that that comes hand in hand. That's great. Evelyn, from a teacher's perspective, what advice would you give school leaders and school districts? The advice that I would give is to tell and show non-white employees, non-white teachers, um, how to become leaders, right? Because we come in here, we're minorities, we're sometimes afraid to even be a leader because we feel we're not going to be taken um, as very important as we should be. Um, so taking out those culture barriers, even language barriers, like show them how they can be included in these leaderships opportunities. Um, so give us a voice, give your employees a voice, um, not only for themselves, but for the people that they represent, so that we're able to represent everyone that, that, we, um, that we associate with. That's great, thank you. Um, Marlon, advice you might give. I would say, um, as far as it's on the recruitment and retention side, when you create the affinity group, um, activate the infinity group, right? So it's one thing to just say you have an affinity group and it's a gathering space. Put the affinity group to, to, to work and have them impact and influence the school community. Uh, create Have the courage to create space for professional learning for the affinity group, right? When you have district in service, yes, all the gifted teachers, they get their, their own authentic space. Your algebra teachers get their own authentic space. Why can't your black male or teachers of color, your affinity group, why can't they get their own authentic space for uh, professional learning for the affinity group, right? Do you have the courage to take two hours out of your in-service time for professional learning specific to the affinity group? My big spice for you is, is to not just create it, but to activate and empower that group to truly make a difference. Put them to work. Great. Thanks, Scott. The advice you would give. You know, I think I think in, in today's in today's world in education, we we're seeing the importance of the of what how relationships play the role of relationships in learning. And our students have to be OK before they can access their learning. They need to be socially, emotionally safe. They need to feel as if they have a trusted adult and, and are and are loved before they can remove any barriers that may exist to achieve their potential. So our educators have to be the same. And if we remove those barriers and create a, an inclusive environment built on the foundation of we want to have genuine relationships, the word of mouth is still the fastest and most successful way of attracting educators because our world is extremely small. Um, we are, our network is, is very tight and it, it's far reaching. Um, and if people are looking for a job, they're probably going to call a friend or reach out to a friend before they apply. Should I do this? What do you know about this? And if the vibe about our district is that it's inclusive, we care about our employees, they have a voice and it's safe to speak up and, and ensure that you can contribute to the improvement, then uh, those, those, those employee shortages, I'm hoping and I'm expecting that they're going to be much less here than they are next door. Kim, can I have right. one other piece of yeah. advice? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and Kim, you did not ask me to say this, but 
leverage the Center for Inclusive Innovation, the design process and the design studios that led both Huntley and Middletown City Schools and the other districts to this, this implementation phase um, has been more than just prototyping, right? You've heard from teachers today, district administrators about the result of the process and how inclusive it was and how it's really serving a diverse uh, uh, um, a staff is, is really a success today. So um, to put a plug in for the Center for Inclusive Innovation, leverage the center, leverage the people there, the process itself really will bring some of that inclusive piece uh, that Ms. Gonzalez referenced earlier. Big fan of the process. Great. A sec Thank I would you. second that as well. Thank both of you. And, it, you know, it's uh, it's been a pleasure, you know, to, to just uh, wrap around as much as we can uh, these efforts that you all are designing uh, to try to bring some of the, you know, it's, uh, it, you know, equity, inclusive innovation happens kind of on the practice and the muscle building. And, and we're just thrilled to be able to um, support you in any way we can to just um, enable that to come to life. Um, I do have one more question because we have a little bit of time, unless there's one from the audience here. Uh, there is an audience question. So let's go to that one here. How do you pull in the adults in school who are not teachers, paraprofessionals, for example, who are already in reach, so to speak? Who wants to start with that one? I'll go real fast. Our Admiral Squad, we started out in the design process around focusing on certified black male educators in the district and building the work around uh, that group. We quickly shifted our thought process as we had conversation across the district to include every black male who was employed by the district to be part of the Admiral Squad. Um, again, perspective, uh, but the, the 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 process for design really led us around becoming more exclusive. So I'm sorry, inclusive, so to say, with with all employees who were black males. Yeah, I, I would say don't don't underestimate the power of a personal invitation. Um, you know, tapping someone on the shoulder and and having a uh, it would be a building principal or the superintendent come say, we have this starting and I would really like you to be involved. Um, it's hard to say no to that. And then once they they take that first step, uh, they see what you know, what opportunity is there and, and, and that our action really does. You know, our words are not just hollow. And that, and that you know, as Evelyn said, she's found that and it's been really rewarding. I, I can't tell that maybe the most rewarding thing out of this experience for me altogether is to hear her say that and because it, it, it's true and I think by and large all schools have that intention yet even for paraprofessionals there's a there's a hurdle there for them to feel as if they're an, an equally valued member of the school community um, that, that comes with building those relationships and sometimes just inviting someone to participate can go a long way that's great uh thank you uh we're getting down to the closing time here I do have a question uh, around the impact as you go forward. Uh, this, and mind you, I know there's, we're still mapping kind of the impact and the indicators of this, this work. Uh, one of the things to think about is that there's the impact of your recruitment and retention efforts. Um, and then there's that impact on the students, right? That are in your buildings by having a more diverse workforce. So I'd love for you to share a little bit about how you think about how you're looking at the impact of this work uh, as we as we wrap up. So uh, Marlon, thoughts? Matt? And impact for the Admiral Squad. This is not superintendent talking, but impact for Admiral Squad is all about representation. Um, as we've been as collectively as a group traveling to different buildings, um, what we really want at the end of the day is for our young black males uh, to see themselves as educators in the future. Um, we've been in buildings and they've asked, are you guys all coaches? Uh, which tells us that we still have work to do. So we really want to just change the uh, the mental mindset of our young black males so they see the, uh, themselves in the profession, representation. Thanks, Marlon. Scott? Well, I think, you know, we mentioned earlier about the, the power of, of providing and building structures so that, that people can engage. Um, you know, we're very proud in our school district that we're in year two of, um, of a recognizing American diversity um, group that has been formed by some of our high school teachers. And, and initially they take um, each month, they take the, um, you know, the inclusivity group that's, you know, for instance, we're in um, 
Students with Disabilities Awareness Month. And, and they are sharing with not only the school community, but our, our, our community at large, from movies to articles to podcasts to music that represents learning and, and not only acceptance, but just exposure. And, and how can I learn more so that I can develop an appreciation for something new to me? And each month it culminates in a, uh, in a, in a community-wide event. It's actually this week for, uh, for our, our um, Students with Disabilities Awareness Month. So, um, and, and a community-wide event that people can come and just engage and, and, and show support, but also learn and, and experience something new. So that this year it expanded to our middle schools, but then also the students. And the students approach that opportunity um, to build something for their classmates and, and have a, a voice in, in this, this, this program that's really growing with popularity. Uh, I want to say, I mean, over 70 students came to the very first meeting with, with that before plans were really rolled out. So the structures of how students can engage to give them that voice, then they'll see there is action with it. And as Evelyn said, that builds trust and, uh, and momentum. Great. Thank you. Rocio and Evelyn, anything to add on what impacts would matter um, from your perspective? I, I will only, you know, I, what Scott said, it's just rad. Our recognizing America diversity has created such an impact district wide, but also about representation. Representation, some of our kids will never have a teacher that looks like them in their whole career, in the whole educational career. So representation is good for the students that are from underrepresented groups, but it's also good for the white students to see what, you know, black, Hispanic, and, you know, in general, underrepresented populations of teachers can do. So I think representation, it's powerful for both. And, and I think that's something that we always have in mind when we are hiring. I, I, I don't know it's the exact number, Scott, but I think between the last three years, we have made an effort in recruiting uh, administrators that look at our students and teachers. And we always have those questions in the interview and we give them every, everybody a chance. So we have a, a very specific, we have done a very specific effort in recruiting because representation, it's sometimes more important than what we think it is for, both, for all of our students. And Evelyn, it's only appropriate to let you have the last word here. <laughs> yes, um, with representation, I also agree, not only teachers, but um, the adults that we're bringing in, um, that was the, the last question that was mentioned too, uh, bringing in adults. Um, I recently had um, a parent come and read a, do a read aloud. It's a parent that's from Mexico and four of my students are from Mexico. So they were able to connect not only because he's from Mexico, but because part of the book was in Spanish. And so after that, they, I mean, they were super happy. So again, having that, um, I, I recently read a book that had talked about having a mirror and a window inside your classroom. The mirror would be where students can see themselves reflect um, who they are, but also a window where students that might not see themselves in something can see it through the window and learn about it. So just as Rocio said, you know, these, the students that might not be from that culture get to learn about that. I love that, the mirror in the window. All right, that'll, that'll stick with me. Thank you so much. Um, folks, this is a last word here. Uh, the work of these districts is being shared through a research paper that we're gonna publish in November and then a, a convening, a showcase that we're gonna have uh, in December where you'll hear from the districts, but also they will show you uh, the work that they've done and how they went from the very beginning to where they are now in this work. So just keep an eye out on that from the Center for Inclusive Innovation. I wanna thank um, Scott, Rocio, Evelyn, and, and Marlon for your conversation today and the audience and uh, everyone have a wonderful day. Take care.